Let's grab our Bibles out. We're in Revelation chapter 14 today, continuing to move through this chapter. We are going to start in verse 6, and we're going to read through verse 11. And let's go ahead and stand up for the reading of God's Word as we do so. Reminding ourselves that God's Word is inspired and infallible and inerrant. Let's listen now to the Word of the true and living God. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Verse 8, And another angel, a second, followed saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Verse 9, and another angel, a third, following them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Amen. You may be seated. I refuse to apologize for how much I love my hometown, Cuyahoga Falls. Uh, I do love my hometown. Just visited on Friday. I grew up there, of course. We have a wonderful, wonderful little um, commons downtown. Cuyahoga Falls, by the way, if you're wondering, is named after the Cuyahoga River, which goes through the town, and there's a, there's a beautiful town square down by the river. Cuyahoga means the crooked river. It's kind of a bent-shaped river, and it's a beautiful place to grow up. I'm happy that I was raised there. We have in the summertime three festivals that we celebrate. We have the Irish Fest, we have the Italian Fest, and then we have the October Fest. And the whole summer really kicks off with our Memorial Day Parade. We have one of the best in downtown, right on Portage Trail. Uh, Portage Trail is so named because the Native Americans used to portage and carry their canoes down as they went to the lower banks of the Cuyahoga River. And so we have this parade there every year, and it's one of the best parades. It really is. All the high school bands come and they play, and uh, emergency vehicles come, and, and they sign off their sirens. And we used to have at least, when I was a kid, we'd have uh, at least one truckload of, of, of World War II vets, and sometimes even World War I vets when they were still alive. And then we'd have various cars revving and things like that. And and yet the parade wasn't over until the very last minute. In the very last minute of the parade, and we we almost forgot every year, but it came every year reliably, three military jets would come screaming over the downtown area. And as a kid, it seemed like those jets were so low that I could almost swear that they tore the limbs off some of the trees as they went by. Definitely, I feel like shingles on houses were were shaking. And every single person was in awe of these jets as they they just ripped right over the tree line. And it was so loud that you could feel it in your chest. Have you ever felt that? The jets are so loud, you just feel it. And your eye sees it first, and then the sound comes a, a split second later. And then every person in the town would be looking up with their mouth agape and their eyes open and their hand pointed to the heavens. And I can't help but think of that feeling, that awe, that tremendous wonder, that compression feel of the sound of the jets going overhead. When I, when I look at this text here in Revelation chapter 14, because what we have here is something of that surprise and that power with these three angels that are soaring overhead here in this text. Now obviously there's a big difference. These angels have not come to entertain the crowd. They've not come to wow the viewers of the parade. They've not come to inspire any sort of patriotism in the hearts of those who would see it. These angels have come with the express purpose to beckon people to repentance, something of a shock and awe campaign, if you will, to plead with sinners to turn to God in faith in Jesus Christ. Now let's just pull in 
a little bit of the context here before we get too deeply into this text here this morning, these three angels. I just want to remind us that, you know, we've really had it rough the last few chapters in the book of Revelation, especially chapter 12 and chapter 13. We labored to go through what John presents as something of this unholy trinity of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. We looked at that in some detail, even considering the number of his name there, that mysterious verse related to the number 666. We did a sermon on that. And then last week, as you recall, we got a little bit of a break um, from all of this sort of dismal imagery related to the beast and the dragon. When last week, you may remember this, we looked at this glorious vision in which John sees the Lamb, and he's standing on Mount Zion. And not only is it a visual um, experience that John has here, but it's also an oral experience experience as he's hearing the singing of the saints and the playing of their harps. Now, this morning, John is going to return then to his normal convention of giving us these septads or these groups of seven. We've seen a number of sevens already in the book of Revelation, and we have several more sevens to go. So if you look with me, just survey here for a moment, that when we get to chapter 15, once again, we're going to see a series of seven plagues and seven angels in chapter 15. And then after that, in chapter 16, we're going to be looking at seven bull judgments to come. And here in chapter 14, we're going to begin what is uh, apparently another septad of angels, these angelic messengers that have come to give us this beckoning, pleading, warning of judgment to come and an opportunity of repentance And so these seven angels that we're going to look at in chapter 14, you can see them here that we're going to have three of them this morning. We're going to see a fourth one in a couple of weeks when we begin to look at chapter 14, verses 14 and following. The order's a little bit unusual, though, because five and six are going to come in close proximity in verse 17. The fourth angel actually ushers in what seems to be another depiction of the final judgment. Remember, in the book of Revelation, you don't just have one return of Christ and one final judgment but rather there's several uh, perspectives on the final judgment, and we're going to get another one of those beginning in verse 14. And so these three angels that we're looking at today, they are technically part of the septad that's going to culminate in chapter 15, verse 1, when he says that he's now seen seven angels. But these three, please know that they do come as something of a trio because their ministry seems to be this pre-judgment warning and beckoning again to repent and to believe in Christ. So what we're going to do this morning is uh, fairly obvious, and if you know me pretty well by now, it doesn't take much of a brain surgeon to kind of probably guess what my outline is going to be. Can you guess? David guessed in the hallway this week. It's pretty obvious. We're going to look at each one of the three angels in turn and consider the message that they have for us by way of calling us to faithfulness and then warning us us of the judgment to come. So the outline, if you're doing an outline in your notes, is pretty easy. Just outline it, angel one, angel two, angel three, and then we'll go on from there, okay? So let's have our Bibles out here. Let's start with the first angel in verse six. He says, and let's read this text. um, He says in verse six, then I saw another angel flying overhead directly with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, and tribe, and language, and people. Okay, so uh, the ESV has another angel. Now, there's a number of ancient Greek manuscripts that just have an angel. In fact, if you have the New King James or the King James, it might just say an angel. The ESV has another angel. Don't worry about that. Don't trip on that. There's not an essential meaning in the different, no difference in the essential meaning here. But, but what has he come to do? He's come to proclaim a gospel to, and look at this, those who dwell on the earth to every nation and tribe and language and people. So we have here yet another angelic messenger. Now in the book of Revelation, he uses the word angelos or angel about 75 times. Okay, Most of those would refer to these angelic messengers who bring us proclamations of warning And judgments. Sometimes, though, we've actually seen angels refer to the fallen angels, which is to say the demons. And at least one time we've seen the same word angelos refer to Christ, and that would be in Revelation chapter 10. A Christ is at least one time described as an angel, a message bearer. Christ is, in fact, the ultimate message bearer. Now, what's really kind of interesting here, or maybe frustrating, depending on your perspective, is that John 
uh, though he's constantly talking about angels, he, he doesn't take a lot of time to describe them or even to tell us whether we've seen these particular angels before or not. Now, we did have some detail and explanation as to the appearance of angels back in chapters 4 and 5, if I'm not mistaken. But clearly, the main point here is not so much what the angels look like, but what the angels say. And this is probably true for the most part in most descriptions of the angels in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. You know, sometimes we're told things like they fly in Isaiah chapter 6 and Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel chapter 10. We do have some basic description of what angels may look like. Sometimes they're described as being very fearsome and powerful beings. And other times, like here in this text, we have virtually no description of them at all. And so I just want you to kind of tuck this away in your memory that angels, angelos means messenger, and it's almost always true that the message is more important than the message bearer, okay? Unless the message bearer is Christ, in which he is the message and the message bearer. But for these angels here, they've come to give a message And I notice here that uh, this language that is used to describe them, I think, is very relevant here. Notice that the ESV says that they are flying directly overhead. And again, if you have the New King James or the King James, it may say something like, in mid-heaven, the Greek there is meso-uranos, meaning in the midst of the heavens. So the ESV translates that as directly overhead. And I think that's relevant. And it's relevant for a couple of reasons. Why do they fly directly overhead? First of all, to remind us that this message is a message from God. The gospel is the message that comes down from heaven to men. Everything else is religion that goes from man's attempt upward. But the gospel is that one unique global message of grace in which God brings the message downward. And so I want you to remember that. The angel is preaching from the midst of the heavens, and he's proclaiming a downward message of hope and grace. This has nothing to do, the gospel, with you and I trying to earn our way up to God. It's nothing like the Tower of Babel, of which see below. We're going to talk about that in a few moments from now. But the gospel is a downward heralding message. It's a message that comes down It's a message that gives hope. It's a message of Christ himself. And so if you hear me at all saying today something to the effect that you need to get your life together and earn your way up to God by way of sort of an upward, vertical, uh, upwardly inclined religiosity, you've missed the whole point of this sermon and every other sermon. Because this is a downward heralding message of the angel offering to us that respite and that hope That comes through Jesus Christ. And so the fact that he is flying meso-uranos in the midst of the heavens, he is preaching downward because grace comes down. Man does not work himself up to the heavens. So I think that's relevant here. The other thing, too, I want to say about this sort of downward proclamation is if he is, as the ESV translated, directly overhead, okay, in the midst of the heavens, then his message is as broad as it possibly can be. Okay, so the angel is at the high point, the peak, the crest, the pinnacle of the heavens, preaching down as broadly as he possibly can. Why is that? Well, because, as it says in the text, notice this, look, he is preaching to every nation and tribe and language and people. In other words, he's at the peak of the heavens so that the message could be heard as broadly as possible. That's important. In fact, the book of Revelation has told us a couple of times now, hasn't it? that this gospel is for, and it gives us these four categories, every nation, that's one, every tribe, that's two, every language, that's three, every people, that's four. Those four categories, we've already seen that. Where have we seen it? We've seen it in Revelation 5, 9. We've seen that in Revelation 7, 9, that great multitude of the saved. And so there's something here of this implication. Remember what Christ said in the sermon to uh, his disciples on Mount Olivet. He said the gospel will be proclaimed to all of the nations, and then, then what? Then the end will come. And so here is sort of this visual depiction of the angel literally doing that. He is preaching this downward, saving, hopeful gospel as broadly and as far as he possibly can so that all of God's elect would be gathered in by grace through faith. Now let's notice this here. There's so much rich language just right here in this line. I don't want to skip it. Look at this. 
Okay, he says, I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth. Now, there's so much there. Okay, first of all, to those who dwell on the earth. What does that language mean? Well, every time in the book of Revelation, he says, those who dwell on the earth, that is a pejorative. It's a negative. It's an insult, even. It means sinners. Uh, those who dwell on the earth are those whose lives is concentrated and centered down here. That's not a good thing. In other words, who is the gospel directed at? The sinners. Okay, so that's why it's described as good, because it's a, it's a means of hope. It's a means of salvation. In fact, the word here, gospel, you, angelos, or good message, that the word gospel is very related to the word angelos or angel. It has the same root word. So it's the, it's the you angel or the, the good message. And it's good, why? Because it's good news for sinners like us. And so if you happen to come here today to Gospel Fellowship overwhelmed with your guilt and beside yourself with your shame because you're a sinner, you actually find yourself to be one of those who dwell on the earth, this pejorative a term to describe those whose life is concentrated down here, then there's good news for you today. The good news of the gospel is that there is an opportunity to be saved from your sin. How? In Christ. And so this angel comes and he's preaching this downward message to all of the nations. And the message is a, mes a message of good news to sinners, to those who dwell on the earth. But that's not it. Look, there's another phrase here that I think is also important. It's, it says, what kind of a gospel is he preaching? What does your Bible say? An eternal gospel. Why is it called an eternal gospel here? Well, probably for a number of reasons. First, is that it saves eternally. Okay, Those who are saved are saved not for just a week or not just a month of clemency or a month of a delayed justice or something like that. Those who are saved are saved eternally. So there's that. That's latent in the text there, but it's, but it's also an immutable gospel. It's not a gospel that changes. It's not a gospel that transforms. It's the same gospel. Okay, So it's an eternal gospel, meaning it doesn't change. It's not going to change next week or next Wednesday or next Lord's Day. We are preaching here at Gospel Fellowship, praise God, the same message that has been handed down to us from every generation of believers that came before us, all the way back to the days of the apostles, all the way back to the Old Testament, to the prophets, the gospel itself doesn't change. Okay? If you hear any innovation coming from this pulpit, that's a, that's a bad sign. What we do here is we proclaim that same unchanging eternal gospel. Not only that, but the one who saves is himself eternal. That's why it's called an eternal gospel. Okay? So the message doesn't change. It saves eternally. And it points to the one who himself does not change. He's called in the book of Revelation the one who was and who is and who is to come. We might even, if we were, if we were going to put on our theological hat this morning, we might even see in this text here a possible reference to the covenant of redemption. What is the covenant of redemption? Do you remember your covenants? Do you know your covenant theology? Okay, The covenant of redemption is that eternal pact between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in which the three persons of the Trinity et eternally agree with one another that the Father will send the Son into the world. He will be the Savior who comes incarnate. And that the Father and the Son will together send the Holy Spirit who will be the one who does the work of changing hearts and quickening lives, drawing people to grace. And so that eternal covenant the covenant of redemption is that eternal pact which the father the son and the spirit made amongst themselves in all eternal glory before the foundation of the world and so even then as ephesians 1 says before the foundation of the world god decreed how it is that he would bring about the salvation of his elect here and so yes this is an eternal gospel eternal in its significance eternal in its foundations, eternal in the one who makes it possible through Christ. And so all of that, I think, is, is probably densely packed in these words here, an eternal gospel to proclaim. Now let's look at the, first, the words of the first angel himself, and they're found in verse 7. Notice this here. Go on to verse 7. And he said with a loud voice, so I'm going to say this emphatically, okay? It's supposed to be said with a loud voice. Fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has come. 
and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So herein is the gospel. Now I take this as something of a representative message of what the angel said. There's a lot more to say about the gospel, I'm sure. Typically, when we think of the gospel, we think of that message that pertains to the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. But notice here in verse 7, there is an offer. And is it a a legitimate standing offer of grace? And the offer comes in these words, Fear God and give Him glory. Now, when when you hear that, that, I I don't want you to think the wrong thing. Fear God, yes. Tremble before Him, absolutely. Be terrified? Well, of course, he's God. But remember that the idea of fear in the Old Testament also comes with it that loving, honorable reverence that we give to our God because we love him just as a child fears and honors and respects his father, right? So it's not just a mere trepidation as though we're going to be crushed, crushed, but, but rather it's that, that reverence, adoring, honor that we give to our Father who loves us. So we fear Him because we love Him, right? And so not not only that, but look at this. Give Him glory, which obviously means to praise Him, but don't forget too that the phrase give Him glory in the Old Testament does at least sometimes mean to confess your sins. Really? Yeah, yeah. Look up Achan, the story of Achan in the book of Joshua chapter 7. What is Achan, that sinner, implored to do? Give God glory. And so what does he do? He confesses his sins out loud. Okay. So to fear God means to lovingly reverence him. And to give him glory means to, yes, acknowledge and confess our sins. Obviously, we're giving him glory by acknowledging that we don't have any in ourselves. And then look at this. Then what do we do logically as a consequence of that? Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So this is the eternal gospel that is proclaimed here, and that gospel is still available today. Okay, it's still available today. You can come to him today. Uh, in fact, I would implore you to do that. If you're not a believer, I would point to you to the words of the angel and say, repent and believe. Even now, you can. And why wouldn't you? Uh, the gospel is ev- available to you even so. Now, Go back to the words eternal gospel here for just a moment in verse 6 because there's one way I don't want to skew that phrase. I think it would be a distortion of the phrase to suggest that it is an eternal gospel because it is eternally available. There will be a day, won't there? Yes, in which the offer of the gospel closes out. And that's part of the reason why there's three angels that come to give a message today. Okay. The first one tells you that the message of the gospel is available even now to be saved. But the next two angels, they're going to come and they're going to warn about the day that that offer does officially close out. Okay. Um, if you take a coupon that you've saved up in your wallet to wherever you're going and you hand over that coupon and, the, and it is dated uh, 2015, it is expired. right? And God is under no obligations... To, uh, to credit that gospel offer after it has expired. And, and the second and third angel will tell us that there is an expiration date, and it's coming quick. In fact, by the time we get to verse 14 of the same chapter, it is already too late. And so what we want to do is we want to heed this message of repent and believe from the first angel now, lest we then befall the consequences of the second and third angel and find ourselves subject to the judgment that's going to come in the fourth angel. Does that make sense? We good on that? Okay, good. All right, so let's then turn our attention then to the message of the second angel. Now, this is a, this is a difficult verse here for reasons I'm going to explain. So let's look at what the angel, second angel says here. Verse 8, Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Now, this is quite a contrast from the first angel. Do you see the difference? The first angel brings a message of hope, the euangelion, the good news of repentance and salvation. But this angel here is announcing a catastrophe that is about to come. What is it? Well, Babylon is going to fall. And now we have to to answer the question, what does he mean by Babylon? And this is a major interpretive question that we're going to need to figure out here either this morning or in the next few weeks. We can think about this a little bit. 
We have some time to interpret this word Babylon here, but let me just give you a little bit of background. The reason why this is a difficult verse is because Babylon, here mentioned in the very first time in the book of Revelation, uh, this is going to be a theme that is only going to open up as we go. Okay, so uh, there's, a, there's at least six more references to Babylon to come. And by the time we get to chapter 17 and chapter 18, look ahead with me in your Bible, just flip ahead for just a minute. References to Babylon are going to come uh, very quickly and very powerfully, especially by the time we get to chapter 18. So it becomes us to try even now to figure out what John is referring to when he talks about Babylon. What exactly is falling or fall in? Okay. Well, let me just let the cat out of the bag early and tell you that, of course, there are a number of different interpretations about what John is talking about here with Babylon. Some would tell you that Babylon is expressly a reference to Rome, okay, to the Roman Empire in general, or to the city of Rome in particular. And there's probably some good reasons for that. In fact, I might go over a couple of those here this morning. There will be others who would tell you that Babylon is simply the concept of the world or worldliness, a concept which is always relevant in every generation, no matter, no matter where you live on planet Earth and no matter what century you're born into. Uh, if the world itself or worldliness is Babylon, then obviously this text is going to have a broad speaking application. There are some others, though, that are especially those who are the preterists or the partial preterists, who are going to interpret this and say, no, actually, Babylon might have some reference to the city of Jerusalem for some very particular reasons that we're going to come up with as we go through these next coming chapters. So I just want to throw that out there so you know that there is a little bit of interpretive difficulty out there with what exactly is falling or falling here. Now, let me just do a little bit of homework with you this morning uh, because I do think this concept is pretty important. So let's think of Babylon for a moment and just do a quick biblical survey of what we mean by Babylon. Okay, so Old Testament survey, first reference, all the way back in Genesis chapter 11 to the Tower of Babel, same place, okay, literal event that actually happened, the Tower of Babel, do you recall this story? Maybe it's been a while, a humankind tried to build up this tower to the heavens, do you remember? And the Tower of Babel was something of like humankind's best effort to build up this earth until they could make it as though humankind could graduate into the heavenly places itself. If we ever wanted a picture of the failures of man-made religion, the Tower of Babel is probably about as good a picture as we can think of in the mind. Uh, in their pride... In their arrogance, in their own self-righteousness, mankind attempted to build themselves a veritable tower to the heavens itself. And what does God do? How does God look upon the Tower of Babel? Do you recall? You remember what God does? It's interesting. You go back sometime in your own time to Genesis chapter 11, and what the Bible tells you there is that the Lord God actually had to come down to the Tower of Babel as though he had to... Uh, he had to lower himself to see it, okay? Anthropomorphically describing God as having to come down. Why so? Because even human, humankind's best effort to build themselves up to heavens, God has to squat down, again, anthropomorphically, and look at it because he can't even see it. He doesn't even recognize. He can't even, he can't, he, 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 it's like he has to squint to see humankind's best effort to make themselves holy like God. And so what does God do? Remember the story? Tower of Babel? He confuses the languages of the world. And so here in the Tower of Babel, you have this depiction of human religion, <clears throat> right? Works righteousness, which is always disgusting in the sight of God. You have humanity's failure to make themselves appreciable to God in His glory. And then God, He, he besmirches the whole project by confusing their languages. So Babel is an entire failure of, of human self-worth and religious arrogance on the part of human beings. Okay? So that's the first thing that ought to just kind of rattle around in the brain. But, but in the Old Testament, Babylon as a pagan nation begins to really take the center stage, especially in the age of the exile. Remember, towards the culmination of the story of the kings, what happens is Babylon, that pagan wicked nation, what does it do? 
Well, it comes in and it conquers Israel. In fact, in 586 B.C., it conquers the city of Jerusalem. Uh, it destroys and ravages the temple of God. And then it drags the people into, into exile. And so Babylon then becomes this sort of prototypical persecuting force that is so often lamented by Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. And so you have Babylon as sort of the picture of governmental persecutorial violence. Yes, violence for sure. And then in the book of Daniel, which obviously, I mean, it just seems like Daniel is always less than an arm's distance from John as he's writing the whole apocalypse, right? Babylon, again, takes center stage as Daniel is persecuted by Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the fiery furnace, Babylon commanding the worship of this 90-foot golden idol, which all God's people must reject, yes, okay? And then what happens? Then Daniel sees his vision of the four beasts coming out of the sea. We've already talked about this. And Babylon, interestingly, is the first beast that rises out of the sea. It's the beast that looks like a lion but is, has the wings of an eagle. You remember that? Babylon is going to fall as it does. It falls to Persia, 539. And so Babylon also becomes sort of this trope of the pagan governmental powers which inevitably must collapse. They must, and they will. Because Babylon is going to be conquered by Persia, going to be conquered by Greece, going to be conquered by Rome, which in itself is going to be conquered by the kingdom of Messiah. That's part of the whole prophecy of Daniel chapter 7. So that ought to be kind of in the mind here too. Now, the references to Babylon really go down quite dramatically in the New Testament. There are only 12 references to Babylon in the New Testament, 260 in the Old Testament, down to 12 in the New Testament, 7 are in the book of Revelation. One of them, very interesting, 1 Peter 5.13. Don't go there, just listen. In 1 Peter 5.13, the apostle Peter is writing, and he says that he's in Babylon. Now, that's interesting because Babylon doesn't exist anymore. And so Peter is probably using the word Babylon, that conquered nation, it's fallen in itself, as a descriptor of the city of Rome. So most biblical commentators think that when Peter says he's in Babylon, he means Rome. It's like, it's like code for the new pagan, empirical, tyrannical, uh, emperor-worshipping government. Okay? So again, that's sort of in context here. Now, We're going to talk more about the identity of Babylon as we go, but I want you just for today to be thinking about the following themes when Babylon is mentioned, okay? Paganism, emperor worship, idolatry, persecution, wealth, lots of wealth here in Babylon, faithful living in exile, even as the theme of the remnant people of God seems to persist, and also trying to live faithfully as a persecuted minority. I think all of those themes kind of amalgamate together in this language of Babylon, just drawn from the whole of the Old Testament and what we have of it in the New Testament. Now, let me bore you, if I can, do my best to bore you with a little grammar in verse 8. Okay? I had a great language arts teacher in seventh grade, and he used to do sentence diagramming on the chalkboard. Raise your hand if you remember sentence diagramming. I can't stand finding another verb, right? But let's look at a little bit of grammatical nuance here that I do think is helpful in interpreting verse 8. Two things. First, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Okay, so that's past tense, right? Fallen is a past tense. Yes, but when you repeat it twice in the past tense here, we have almost this um, Hebrew concept that's, that's presented in the Greek here called the prophetic perfect tense. And what that means is, we don't need to make this more complicated than it is, but this is when you speak of something in the past tense that is actually going to happen in the future. Okay? It's so sure, it's spoken of as a past tense, fallen fallen and emphasized twice to emphasize its certainty to come in the future so that's the prophetic perfect tense it's going to happen okay the other thing that's interesting here is we have and you never need to remember this a day in your life we have a sentence here that's called a genitive causative phrase and usually that's when you have the phrase of piled up in repetition here so look at the genitive causative here 
Notice this. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Okay, so what is, what's the big idea? The wine causes the passion, and the passion causes the sexual immorality. That's a genitive causative string. Okay. I think that's important. Uh, her wine causes this madness, and this madness causes the sexual immorality. That's the idea. And what John tells us is that will not stand. It absolutely will fall. Okay. Um, real quick story. Time is going by quickly this morning. I remember when we, Kelly and I, we moved to Florida. We had one of those situations where you have to buy a house in a week. You ever been in that pressure cooker before? It's terrible. We, we had a presbytery meeting. We had a church votes that took place. We had to sell our house in Ohio. It all came down to seven days to find, finance, and acquire a house. And I remember the stress and the pressure of doing that. And I was introduced to the term sinkhole before, which I'd never heard that term. Do you know what a sinkhole is? Never heard of a sinkhole in Ohio. We don't have sinkholes. I told you I'm, come, I'm from Cuyahoga Falls. All right? I'd never heard of that. So uh, do we have sinkholes here? I don't think we do. They yes. do? Do we? Okay. John says we do. I'll take it on his word. Not used metaphorically. They're actual sinkholes. So Florida is a, is a large peninsula. It's made on the sand. Underneath the sand is water. And what happens in sinkholes is your house will suddenly be swallowed up into the earth. It happens. It's the craziest phenomenon and sometimes you know it's going to happen if you see a crack over the door frame or your windows don't fit anymore or something weird is happening like that. And when you're looking at houses, if they have any sign of a possible sinkhole, you stay away from that house. Because I'm telling you, it happened two miles from my house. Uh, a house just disappeared into the earth. Residents and all just gone, sunk into the earth. Absolutely terrifying. If you don't know what I'm looking at, Google images of Florida sinkholes, it will freak you out. It is terrifying. And what John is saying here, that's what he's saying. Like his picture is Babylon, this culture of sexual immorality, this paganism, this wickedness, this concoction of persecutorial violence and madness. It is going to sink into the earth and be utterly destroyed. Do not build your life here. That's the point. That's what the second angel is saying. Okay. Now quickly, uh, time is fleeting here. I'm waxing on eloquent, I guess, this morning. Let's look at the message of the third angel here. There is something that I want to pull out, very important here in this text. Now notice a little bit of repetition with previous themes we've covered in the series. Verse 9, another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath. Now, we've talked about the mark, so I'm not going to linger long here today, but I do want to talk about the wine because this is an important theme here in this passage, and the reason is because we have wine mentioned twice, so this is not an accident. Notice in verse 10, we have the wine of the cup of God's wrath, and it's contrasted here in proximate juxtaposition to the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality from Babylon, so that's not an accident. Two cups of wine, uh, two that produce this madness. But the idea here is that if you drink the seductive wine of Babylon's porneia, that's the Greek word for her adultery, then you will most certainly also drink the wine of God's wrath. That's a fearsome thought. Because notice here that when he pours out the wine of his wrath, it comes in a cup unmixed. In other words, the whole of the wrath is forthcoming. Now, I don't want you to think I chickened out on verse 11. Okay? That's the scariest verse in the Bible right there. Or one of them. And we're going to come back to that next week. So I'm not dodging this text. We're going to come back to that theme next week. But I do want to mention this cup of the wine of God's wrath a little bit more, and then we're going to close, I promise. Jesus, um, picking up on this, this prophetic trope of the wine, the cup of God's wrath from Isaiah, 
from Jeremiah, from Psalm 75. This is a somewhat common image of the cup of the wine of God's wrath. Jesus mentions it three times. Do you know what those texts are? I'm going to go over them real quick, and then we're going to close. First, do you remember the time the disciples were arguing about who is the greatest? And Jesus asked them a question. He said, can you drink the cup that I drink? And he was referring to the cup of the wrath of God. And the disciples, in a weak moment, they say yes. And they were absolutely wrong. They cannot drink the cup that Jesus will drink. Second reference, Gethsemane. Jesus is agonizing hours before he goes to the cross and he prays to the Father. And what does he pray? Do you remember? He says, Father, remove this cup from me, not as I will, but as you will. And the Father does not remove the cup from the Son, though he asks for it. And Jesus accepts this. And then the third mention to the cup of his wrath we are going to look at. Turn your Bible here to John chapter 18. I want you to see this. This occurs at the very moment of Jesus' betrayal. In John chapter 18, I'm going to pick it up in verse 6, but the salient language is in verse 11. I'll give you a moment to turn there. John chapter 18, verse 6. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the grounds. And so he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you, I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken of those whom you gave me. I've lost not one. Now watch this. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, he drew it and he struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, this is the third mention of the cup, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? He's come to total acceptance now that he is going to drink the cup of the wrath of God. In fact, it's exactly what he does. Beginning in this moment, beginning right here in this moment, Jesus is going to receive all of the mockery, all of the scolding, all of the shame, all of the physical violence, He's going to receive the nails. He's going to receive the flogging, the piercing, the hanging on the cross. Jesus is going to drink the full cup of the wrath of God. And that leaves us to consider here, Gospel Fellowship, as we close. You know, it's true, isn't it? Either you're going to drink that cup, or Jesus has already drank the cup of God's wrath for you. Which is it going to be? This is the message of the third angel. I trust and I hope that you believe that Christ has already drank the cup of God's wrath for you because you don't want to taste even a drop of the unmixed wrath of God. And we will come back to that theme next week. 